So welcome everyone. Sorry for the short break, uh, but we'll make it up during lunch. Uh, so my name is Dimitri. I'm moderating a panel about cross-chain protocols. And with me, we have Phil Lusok from uh, Parity. We have Zach Imanian from Trusted IoT Alliance and Cosmos. And we have Jack Platz from the Web3 Foundation. I'll give you guys uh, one or two lines of intro, uh, and then we move from there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Phil. I work at Parity Technologies. I focus on uh, product product communications. Um, and yeah, I've been in the blockchain space since 2013. Been very interested in uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum and especially cross-chain interoperability, which seems like the next logical step. My name's Zaki. Uh, I'm wearing my Cosmos hat today. And uh, I've been also in the blockchain scene since 2014 and am very excited about sort of starting to deliver scalability protocols and the sort of Cosmos vision of scalable blockchains. Hi, I'm Jack. Um, I work at the Web3 Foundation and I work on Polkadot stuff, so partnerships and community, and um, I'm excited about these different ecosystems that are being built, um, including Cosmos, including Polkadot, including some of the other ones. and. Um, kind of the, the communities that are being built, the private businesses that are being built on top of these extensible protocols and interoperability plays a huge role in enabling that sort of thing. Um, and I think brings a whole new wave of people into this ecosystem. So those are the things that excite me about it. All right, um, I wanna start with a little poll. Um, who is building cross-chain protocols? All right. Who wants blockchain protocols? Who wants them? Who needs blockchain protocols? Everyone. Well, I think that we have to have more builders. <laughs> so, I, well, first of all, what are these blockchain protocols? And maybe these cross-chain pr protocols, what are they from your point of view, um, such that the audience knows what we're talking about? Uh, yeah, cross-chain protocols uh, enable interoperability between different blockchains, different kinds of blockchains especially. Um, and allowing, right now, the current state is everyone is building their unique state machines that are accounting for whichever um, processing they want to do on the shared ledger. And they're all being isolated in uh, communication and security. So there's low security for these new chains and um, they're unable to communicate with one, one another. And we're forced to uh, rely on exchanges uh, to make that happen right now and very centralized exchanges or Shapeshift, which is also very centralized and doesn't have a lot of liquidity. Um, so what we need is to enable um, more innovation in order to but at the same time, uh, maintain a high level of security so that when these chains get deployed, they can uh, rely on each other and enable um, different use cases uh, that can be specialized. Different blockchains can specialize in different ways, yet they can talk to each other and rely on each other and make the ecosystem as a whole much, much better. So I think the way I think about this is, is that we've been sort of impoverished as builders by give, having one set of tools, which is the smart contract. Um, smart contracts are certainly a rational way of like of building certain kinds of systems, but the world where you where building your own blockchain is incredibly hard um, and a huge amount of work leads to a world where we have much less innovation and uh, like new innovations have long time to market. Um, and I would say this is a sort of a principal reason why things have been slow. So I think you've been seeing. Um, sort of parallel innovation in many ways between Polkadot and Cosmos, but their both goals are to uh, sort of eliminate these boundaries to innovation by having both a model of, of where new chains are easy to build, easy to integrate into an ecosystem, and then that you have protocols that emerge as compositions between the specialized properties of multiple chains. I'm gonna ask a small question on that, so. Um, Talking about cross-chain protocols, do you think, from your point of view, they should encourage people to create specific blockchains that tie into a group of blockchains? Or would you say that some parts become open markets and commodities and just pick a, a chain from the market without building it yourself? 
So, okay, so the, 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 the simple answer to that question is um, there will definitely be some commoditization of that of, in that ecosystem. It's, it's certainly not clear that every builder needs their own blockchain. Um, but there are scalability and throughput related benefits in addition to uh, simplicity of analysis and uh, benefits to having a specialized protocol where you don't have as much you know, ad hoc behavior. Um, so I don't think we figured out what those design patterns are and really what we're building is, ena is enabling exploration of the space for the first time. Yeah, I agree with a, a, lot, of, a lot of that. Um, the experimentation that comes with new tool sets that make it really easy to build blockchains makes a ton of sense. Um, and it's very similar in the way some of these projects are approaching this space. Um, and it's interesting to actually see this interoperability in this um, increased design space, this um, ability to build blockchains more easily, kind of going hand to hand with like the Cosmos SDK and Parity Substrate um, as kind of on ramps into those ecosystems and potentially those ecosystems still Obviously, the potential for them to interoperate is, is important. And then, I mean, on, on what, um, and I, I, I wonder what the, the answer is as to why that is, I guess. Um, why that makes sense that these two kind of innovation, experimentation on one hand, um, and interoperability on the other hand goes hand in hand. That might be interesting to talk about. Um, but as far as what Phil said, as far as what we're relying on now, as in, in terms of exchanges, and that's just one component of it. Value between blockchains and uh, unlocking these silos of value is one thing, but unlocking the silos of data is another thing. Um, and, and we're excited by the, the potential to unlock a whole new host of use cases um, that wouldn't be possible before, right? Real world applications that allow things to get done in, um, for all of us, right? Not this kind of abstract blockchains talking to each other, but actually new use cases <clears throat> and imagining those use cases. Yeah, let's talk about a bit about those. Like, what does it exactly enable? Huh? And maybe, I, I especially want to see w w what drives you. Like, if you want to eat your own dog food, saying, that, "Okay, let's assume there is some cross-chain uh, protocol." Uh, what would be the first things you would love to experiment with? Uh, definitely, I'm personally very interested in the governance aspects. So, what we've seen with Bitcoin, when Bitcoin first came out, nobody was talking about governance or how to upgrade this. Um, yeah, everyone assumed it would be upgraded and it would be able to handle all the potential we see in blockchains now. Um, but over time, we saw that there were a lot of different stakeholders who entered the space, entered Bitcoin, and um, there was a lot of political disagreement. And this is because it tried to be one chain for the world. And when you try and put everything under this single jurisdiction, it creates a lot of tension and a lot of stagnation. And same thing, similarly, is happening in Ethereum. I worry, but I, I'm pretty confident that it will happen. But what, what interoperability really allows, it's super important, is enabling different communities to pop up, work on their own state machines, and attract the members to that community for this specific purpose, whatever kind of market or community it may be. So they want to be involved in the governance process, and they have the most stake to upgrade their protocols how they see fit. And then if I don't care about the governance of that protocol and it's just useful to me, I can interact with it without even staking anything in it. I can, I can send a smart contract from my blockchain that I care about and I want to be involved in the governance in, and I just use the utility of the other blockchains that are governing themselves. It allows for real independence of you know, protocol development, which will uh, increase the, the rate of innovation, for sure. Yeah, I think the emergence of digital tribes and, and, and have the decoupling of governance and maybe also of financial assets to those underlying markets might be one of the main things uh, to... Maybe, Zaki, you have another view? Yeah, so just to extend that theme, yeah. I, we we strongly agree with the with the idea that like uh, the biggest part of the value addition is instead of trying to focus an entire global community into a single governance process and try to like sort of find the common ground and the common path forward between hundreds of disparate you know interests um, allow people of nationally convergent interests to form systems and communities. 
But the other piece is, is you do not want to become economically unlinked. We don't want to build a set of economic islands, which is largely what we've been building in the blockchain space so far, which is like when some new chain comes up, up there's a maximalist vision or, around it that will is involves it sort of stealing all use cases and all ac sort of examples uh, or applications and these sort of economic ecosystems from in a sort of zero sum game. Um, the sort of interchain world is sort of imagining a positive sum world where you have these where the you have these different tribes but they are economically connected to each other they are existing in trade and specialization with each other in the way that like nations specialize in different things but trade with each other and we actually get like a world that is better so some chains will specialize in smart contracts some chains will specialize in stability some chains will specialize in sound money why not have a world where all of those things are economically linked so no winner takes all we are not maximalists well the open market the free market is not but as we have seen like we have the amazons facebook's and google's uh, so how are we different well so i mean i think the the sort of somewhat unique thing about all of this stuff is that each chain in cosmos only exists to the extent that it's a useful social shelling point um and shelling points can be forked um, and that will hopefully lead to a world where we don't create monopolies again. Hooray. Yeah, uh, Jack, maybe if you think about uh, looking at it from a Web3 ecosystem point of view, uh, I, I'm assuming this inter-blockchain protocols and communication is really important, and especially if you want to build those layer two applications out of that. Are there some of those applications that you're looking forward to, or as something that you would envision to be? Uh, Definitely ocean. Um, it, it, personal you could, yeah. I mean, talking about use cases, you could um, maybe chime in on potentially some of the benefits you look for in these things. Um, but as far as like a layer one goes, um, there's a couple of properties that we think are important. One's like open governance system for sure. Um, but the other is what we've been talking about, which is this notion of extensibility, like a modularity, like a stack, wherein um, different protocols can plug into it for different capabilities and leverage them. Um, and it's, it's built in a way so that it's very easy to do that from the APIs, everything just building it up so it's, um, it's like laying bricks, right? Um, so that's that's something that um, um, from like the Web3 tech stack point of view that we, we, we think is really important. Yeah, and that makes sense. And you have the layers of abstraction such that people don't have to care which substrate they're working on. Um, now maybe to go more into the nitty gritty of things, uh, I'd love to know what you guys are exactly doing with these inter-blockchain communication protocols. Uh, maybe you can, think about an important technical aspect that you're trying to implement or you have implemented and why that was important? Yeah, so um, Polkadot, uh, the testnet was launched uh, earlier this year and um, it's been running very well so far. Uh, and it actually kind of morphed over time into Substrate, uh, not the testnet, but the software that's running uh, the testnet. And, uh, what what happened in July was the first time of when we went from the proof of concept one, which launched the testnet, had a lot of features, going to POC two, which had some extra uh, features, including like light client support, parachain support, uh, coming together, co-finalization, you know, final finalizing all the different link chains at the same time. Um, in uh, July it was the first uh, runtime upgrade. Uh, governance-based on-chain runtime upgrade, which means there's a forkless upgrade of the system. And the entire network, um, if those who participated, yes, it's a test net, no value bearing there, but it did happen. And that's kind of like the main, one of the main benefits of being able to, to kind of have a WebAssembly VM is you can have the, the client that you're running at home just recognize that there's a new version and start interpreting it. Uh, no, no action needed from the user, only the governance action of voting for or against it. Um, so that's really cool. Um, basically, we're working very close on implementing our new uh, consensus algorithm into the POC3, which will be out in a few days, maybe a few weeks. Um, and then after that, we'll have the real um, early next year where we'll have interchain communication. 
It's very exciting to hear. Uh, Cosmos has been developing also for a few years now. Um, so maybe Zaki from your uh, tech. Yeah. So we've had. Um, so, so our consensus engine Tendermint, which is sort of uniquely suitable because of its sort of cheap light client proofs and fast finality engine for like a multi-chain architecture, has been essentially feature complete for about a year. And uh, we've been in these like large scale public test nets where we've been running our consensus engine among hundreds of strangers with extraordinary stability for a long time. Um, this last cycle has been consumed with essentially finishing our MVP proof of stake implementation that has staking, slashing, delegation, and fee distribution, all of which was extraordinarily hard, like harder than we anticipated, um, but is essentially done. The feature complete proof of stake releases today. Um, and so with proof of stake done, we intend to launch sort of the MVP hub mainnet um, towards the end of the year. We're sort of in an auditing cycle. Um, and then after the hub is launched, it will be start to upgrade. Um, it will be upgraded with features like uh, the Im sort of initial token centric uh, interblockchain communication spec. And then we will go on from there. Yeah, some of this is redundant because um, I'm also uh, know the most about Polkadot, and that's what I work on um, at the Web3 Foundation, which is the Treasury. Did the crowd sell for Polkadot? And, um, it's very intentionally not called the Polkadot Foundation because of this vision of Web3 and these other technologies we fund, um, but still coming at it from that, that perspective since that, that is the, our main project. Um, and we're contracting parity technologies to build the first client implementation in Rust, um, and then additional implementations in other languages that we're giving grants for um, in Go and, 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 think, and um, maybe another language. So a um, little bit redundant, but yeah. Um, POC4, um, as Phil mentioned, is going to be probably the most exciting POC for um, Polkadot because it's going to be kind of the most developer friendly, get your hands dirty, um, build your own blockchain, start to uh, take advantage of the test net in terms of this notion of interoperability and starting to play with different use cases there. Um, so early next year for that. But otherwise, we have a live test net that you can like go on your browser, on your phone from day one uh, in use. And uh, if you build a chain with Substrate, you get that, like the JavaScript UI for free, um, as well as all of the other, like the light client um, and all the different tools, like the tele telemetry information services, so you can see where the nodes are on the map. Um, super user-friendly stuff. Uh, and, and the team has the benefit of building a couple nodes for Bitcoin, uh, for for Ethereum, so doing this now a third time for Polkadot, it's kind of the down, um, from the ground up, you can kind of reimagine all the things that did or did not go well with Ethereum and um, implementation and, um, and optimize for those. So it's, I'm impressed by like how user, for, right, right, you can like stake in three clicks, which is kind of cool. You can interact in the governance module and like vote in, I don't know, maybe four clicks and you know, see how that's going and then people are building open source like networking, um, like network indicators as to where the governance process is and who's winning the vote and all these things and like they're just doing that, right? Because it's an open source community. Um, so that's all really neat to see come together and all of the stuff, whenever you build your chain, right, it comes for free. So it's just, for me, that's the exciting, compelling point of, of what we're doing here. So we have a few inter-blockchain protocols here. Uh, I've been working on Interledger for a while. You, you guys do parity with the Relay Hub and the Cosmos Hub. Um, what I'm then thinking is that how do these things interoperate with each other? Huh? Uh, is there interoperability between their interoperabilities? Um, and then maybe a question, how would you see each other's integrating? Uh, like, w would the Cosmos Hub become a parachain to the Relay uh, or the other way around? Or? Well, I, I can answer the interlender question because we have a project called Kava um, that is building a Cosmos zone and should have a test net up in running in like the next month or two, which is explicitly an, uh, an interledger focused zone. So it's the, the point of it is to sort of offer essentially like a digital retail front end uh, to the co to Cosmos, allowing you to use interledger to, you know, buy and use assets on Cosmos. Um, it's probably like it's it's one of the mechanisms by which Cosmos then can become economically linked. Um, to those sort of wider blockchain ecosystem without just relying on centralized exchanges, but uh, it's just the first stage, and you know we have peg zones also in in process. Yeah, I'm I'm sure uh, there if 
there's there will be a need. I mean, we're kind of like focus, it's still the very early stage, so we're focusing on uh, what what Polkadot should be uh, focusing on, which is uh, really uh, arbitrary message passing across chains and parachains, shared security, um, the kind of things we're, we're focusing on. But we also want to, of course, link to um, like Bitcoin and Ethereum using a bridge um, where they don't get the benefits of shared security, but they do have um, definite cross-chain communication. And I see no reason why having uh, more bridges to more platforms is would, would ever hurt. Would that mean that the definition of a bridge is this Uber standard? The definition of a bridge? Uh, well, l let's say if if we want to connect uh, chain A to chain B, whatever they are, whatever uh, substrate they run on, um, there is a few things you have to bear in mind. I think about atomic swaps, I think about finality, I think about a few other things, um, which you probably can express in a specification, uh, saying that if you want to interoperate with this uh, state chain versus that state chain, just make sure you have that abstraction. Yeah, exactly. And the, like, well, this is the issue. Like, it becomes real complicated when you're dealing with a lot of different state machines, different kinds of UTXO models, and without finality and all this stuff. So. Um, what bridges will be developed over time? Uh, they won't be. There won't be a standard. Um, there is a, a framework for this, these bridges to be built, and there is some some sort of uh, trade-offs you have. Yeah. So you don't get the the security of the proof of stake network on Polkadot, um, but like something like Bitcoin has plenty of uh, security on its own, um, and they get to maintain their autonomy. Um, but there, uh, you don't get all this, the, the kind of finality. So it might be time delays because you need to wait for a certain amount of blocks on a chain without finality. And that's a, according to whatever the community will decide, uh, the markets decide when they build those bridges. Yeah, just touching on the bridges, it's um, we like it is a solution for Bitcoin and Ethereum, particularly because they do have such um, high security. The values of the network are high. Um, and um, so they can be bridged, and it makes sense. You still have the delays, and it's not a native chain or a native uh, native parachain or a zone. Um, but it is, um, and it, but it, and it still does benefit from the inter the interchain communication. But um, it, it makes it tougher because the the attack vector is such that if the cause on one chain results in an effect on another chain, and then that bridge chain is then reverted, it's difficult without the, the, the notion of shared security to then um, make sure that the effect on the chain is, is, is also reverted at the same time. Um, and so it's not it's imperfect and doesn't really prove out the use case, I'd argue, of interoperability, but it, um, it, it's a bridged interoperability. So I think what, we've, what we're, we're very much seeing is like sort of there are two classes of chains in these interchain ecosystems. Um, one class of chain is the sort of native interoperable chains, which, um, which are sort of native to the ecosystem, operate within this, within like the sort of rich interchain communication and security model. And then you have the reality that once you have like a Byzantine fault tolerant, fault attributable, slashable, stakeable computer, it's pretty much easy, it's doable to build an adapter to anything, um, to any centralized ledger system, to any decentralized ledger system. Like these are extraordinarily versatile tools and um, sort of the, a big part of like what we've been doing for the last years is, is getting those tools to the level of maturity that people can really start, you know, doing all of the crazy stuff that they can do with them. Um, I think I have two more questions and then we'll open it to the audience. Um, one question would be to, like, let's look a, li a little bit about uh, risks and maybe some mitigations of those risks. Um, because as I see it right now is that when we played around with a seven ledger atomic swap, uh, the delays are just absurd. The amount of staking you have to do at each hop to, to get that cascade of security, and now you have this tapered delay. Like, I came a bit worried that the user experience would die out from just that fact. Um, what do you see like as the main risks uh, for inter-blockchain communication, the main hurdles to overcome in the first uh, maybe year to adoption? So I think there's, there, is a ch there is a challenge of, so 
I, mean, I think the, um, the experience that you had with atomic swaps is a good example of why atomic swaps have not really taken off as, a, as an interoperability solution. Not only do they not really do what people want, which is take the assets that they have to the computations that they want, they're more value transfer semantics. Um, they also have a terrible liquidity user experience. It's probably why I'm a kind of a lightning skeptic. Um, but so like these interoperability pro protocols that are in the Cosmos, Polkadot world, like don't suffer for any of those flaws. Um, and the latency of moving between things between chains is on the order of under 10 seconds um, in Cosmos. So that is also not as much of a, a, of an, of a, a, a fundamental usability challenge. I think the biggest challenges are, are going to be sort of uniform APIs between chains. Um, if the like interface for interacting with the token on every chain in Cosmos is radically different from each other, um, it is going to be difficult for people who are building client applications and user facing applications to to sort of offer like a sane user experience when you move an asset on a DAP chain into a DEX. Um, and so I think there's going to be an enormous amount of pressure towards sort of uh, interface normalization um, in our ecosystem. We've started this effort with something we call the interchain standards, which are sort of uh, where we're encouraging chains in our ecosystem to maintain like consistent interfaces for like basic ideas like staking and tokens and governance. Yeah, so some of the, the biggest risk is um, what we've seen, uh, like parity is a client developing we've, we've developed clients um but we're a core infrastructure company so the experience of dealing with with nodes uh, and, and how burdensome that can that can become um it's it's a huge risk to be able to have like everything on one chain and running this huge node um so we're trying to avoid that with this time by building like client standards in from the beginning instead of slapping them on a running system, which will prove to be really, really helpful for businesses who want to use these same interfaces you're talking about. So I can use the same client on my phone as the mainframe other than I'm just verifying the headers on my phone. I get to use the same interface doing the same things. Like if I'm scanning a package at a factory, they have their their, their system there, I have the light client on my phone, and I can use that same system and communicate directly with it. There's no need to write a new app about this. Um, and I have the permissions as an employee to automatically only scan certain pa packages or only ship them in certain ways. So all this stuff you get built in from the ground up. The risks, uh, it's really uh, taking the, the learnings of everything we've learned from Ethereum and building them in from the ground up right now. Yeah, on the, on the use, usability part, um, that's a super exciting like use case whenever someone just has their data or has access to a pool of data, like all the hotels that are available in this area, and they just um, kind of port themselves into that, and then they can take advantage of it without having to go to these silos like Travelocity versus Orbits versus all of these things. That's like an exciting aside. Um, but in terms of in terms of the obstacles, um, it's just making these. Ex from, from my perspective, I mean, there's lots of different perspectives, but my, my perspective is just getting the developer mind shares difficult, um, and getting the like the onboard the on ramp to learn um, Rust or something that compiles onto Wasm. In our case, is um, you know it takes some effort, um, and the documentation has to be there, the education has to be there, the um, ability for people to get their hands dirty, like in workshop, has to be there. So. That's, that's something I think about. Then just once they are there, what kind of chains already exist in this ecosystem? And what, what can they take advantage of? What's the tooling as well? Um, so incentivizing teams and working with teams to actually get them from day one to have live, like a live WASM-based smart contracts platform on Polkadot from day one is super exciting. And someone's just building that. It's called Edgeware. Um, so we're going to need more different versions of that and more people. Like we need a Zcash-like chain. We need so there's you know, ZK Snarks available from day one. We need all of these things, um, and not no one person can build them, or no one company can build them um, to make this whole ecosystem kind of move forward. It's going to take a lot of a lot, a lot of different teams. Well, that's why we're here now. Uh, I guess a lot of projects here. Uh, how how I build up this stack in my head, and maybe I'm wrong, but uh, at the bottom we have inter-blockchain messaging. 
On top of that, we have um, state synchronization or state um, validation across blockchains. On top of that, we might have market makers um, exchanging the tokens. On top of that, we then have our compute infrastructure. And you mentioned WASM, uh, which is probably a very interoperable way of sending code across multiple types of uh, runtime environments. Um, have you guys seen a lot of adoption about this like end step for the developer of saying that if you want to build blockchain inter blockchain applications, you probably are going to need to compile to Wasm at some step. Um, have you seen people taking mass adoption towards this trend, or is it still like in stealth mode, or what's happening there? Um, so yeah, I, I, there's a long list of languages that compile to Wasm, but it's still very early in the WebAssembly. So WebAssembly is a standard for, for uh, made by Google, Microsoft, Apple to um, have cross-platform support for running uh, code in uh, your machine. And that's why it seems like the perfect fit for blockchain. Not it's like the idea was to be able to run applications natively in the browser, but we're not running it in a browser. We're running it in a virtual machine. On, on a blockchain. Uh, the reason is to have this cross-platform support and also to really have, yeah, the client that just talks to the blob of code in, in the blockchain instead of running the code on your computer that interprets the code. And that really enables a lot because mostly you have this chance of writing in Rust, a smart contract in Rust or C++, and it compiles down to WASM. The challenge right now is getting, uh, Rust is a relatively new language. It's growing very, very quickly. But yeah, not a lot of people like writing in Rust. And that's understandable. Everyone has a different preference. Um, but if you, there's a long list of languages that are compiling to Wasm. It's still in the early days. There's going to be better support in the future. Um, I've heard some rumblings of Solidity even being compiled to, to Wasm uh, in the future. And we, as long as we have that and the momentum keeps going where it's as it's been going, then yeah, that won't be a problem because every language will be supported. For, from folks just I've talked to, there's like um, the eWASM team on Ethereum, there's kind of a, a consensus amongst um, different cohorts um, of the Ethereum community that. Um, parts of the virtual machine need to be traded out for WASM, and that's kind of the future. Um, and um, Solidity, for all of its, for how far it's gotten us as a smart contracts platform um, language, is not necessarily um, going to continue to be the way forward. So um, I'm hoping that's more obvious than not to some folks, but um, it's part of getting that developer mind share. Um, let's move to the uh, some questions of the audience. What I will do is I will give each of you a T-shirt that you can give to the question you like the most. So it's a it's basically a little incentive game for the audience. Um, who's starting? I see one here. Uh, but I'm gonna because so, a new voice. Thank you. Um. Let me see you when I ask my question. Um, so my question is, with all this interchain communication, will there be some kind of discovery mechanism so that I can make sure that the contract I'm calling on this other chain or the function I'm calling actually does exist and uh, yeah, that my call is not going to the void? Or is there something that I have to make sure when I compile my, my program? So the addresses of the destination. I like this question, by the way. Yeah, no, this is a great question. It's something that we've been, we're sort of in the early days of thinking about. Um, there have been a couple of companies that have come to us and proposed like building centralized services um, as sort of discovery indexes. And we're sort of also vaguely interested in the idea of somebody building a decentralized version of this. Um, of the indexing and, and sort of uh, namespacing of, of what's available across the zone ecosystem. I think it's a huge business opportunity um, and would definitely encourage someone to pursue it because nothing really fits into that ecosystem yet. Um, I sort of, some of the stuff that Yaniv is working on at the graph is a potential um, sort of, some potentially fits that kind of general shape, but like in general, yeah, this is a huge opportunity. 
Yeah, I'll stand up as well. Um, in, so I think when we're um, talking about blockchain, there's like mainly two advantages for like applications to use the same blockchain. So first, like you have the interaction of like smart contracts using other smart contracts, and I think that's going to be mostly the messaging layer that addresses that. But the second point is that um, multiple like projects and applications using the same blockchain has a positive effect on security for all of them because the value gets bigger. How is that like addressed in uh, each of your projects? Yeah, one core feature of Polkadot is about it, the security. Because when you launch a new chain with a new project, you, the reason people are gravitating towards something like Ethereum is because they get that, that guarantee of security. Um, if I were to just launch my random blockchain and put it out there, there's a website you can go and see how much it costs to 51% attack blockchains. And like the smaller your network is, the easier it is to attack. And we've seen this in the past with other Bitcoin forks. They just, the miners change which protocol they use and destroy that network. And how, because we're encouraging many uh, different blockchains, um, how do we guarantee security? And that is through uh, Polkadot's relay chain and the validators on that relay chain. Um, they pool every parachain that joins Polkadot benefits from the aggregate of all the security together. They are bonded in that network as the validators that are for each parachain are randomly selected and sharing each other's messages. And this is what makes it a decentralized trust mitigated, mitigated system. Yeah, so if you were to cover what probably is the fundamental disagreement between Polkadot and Cosmos, which is leads to having two systems, is we think that, that, that the relay chain approach to shared security is misguided for a variety of reasons that are too complex to go into right now. But the design of Cosmos is, that fun, is fundamentally that the job of each hub is to isolate security failure on a zone from the rest of the ecosystem. So zones should stand on their own. They should be secure. And Tendermint gives you a lot of security by default. Um, it is, it's not still non-trivial uh, to do things like, 50, there's no like opportunity to like show up and 51% attack a Tendermint zone. Um, you have to buy up stake. Um, you have to engage in these very complex attack behaviors, um, which I think tooling will get better around um, projecting, but our, our view is that you know the hub's job is to isolate failure and, and ensure compositionality even among the possibility that a zone security might fail. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, how did you guys decide that this is the right time to be building interoperability solutions given how few users and use cases there are on different chains? I'll take it. the first stab. So, I mean, like, the honest answer is, is that, like, the promise of open finance on Ethereum is a bit of a, is deceptive. Like, the design of Ethereum it was, was, like, obviously ill designed for this use case. Um, and like we started working on this two years ago because when we started seeing these behaviors, we we're like, okay, this is great, but no one will be able to actually use this, will actually be able to do this at scale at Ethereum. At best, this is a prototype. So we've been focused on, like we started building this because this actually lets you do these kinds of like token engineering, token mechanics, interoperability, like experimentations, but at consumer scale. So when <clears throat> Gavin Wood wrote the, the Polkadot paper, um, the idea was extending Ethereum. That was like the whole point. Um, and it was, um, it was becoming clear to the, the, the parody team and, and, and to Gavin that um, sharding and, and scaling with Ethereum would be a project that would take five, well, 10 years. Um, and Polkadot was really supposed to be something that was uh, a sharding-like solution because of the parachains and um, the notion of them parallelizing transactions and um, uh, running them at the same time um, would be able to um, be delivered much more quickly and um, would have the benefits of this, n it's not infinite scalability, but um, pushing the limits of scalability much further than a, uh, any other design system could do at the time. So um, I think that's one of the reasons why it made sense for him and Parity to, to, to think about 
solutions to augment Ethereum at that point. Um, yeah, so hi hey everyone. And first of all, thanks for the great discussion. So I'm Michael, I work with a project called Oath Protocol based out of Shanghai. And I really like the fact that you guys were talking a lot about governance and I believe that's kind of a missing part of blockchain security with a lot of people talking about the technology part, um, which is also important, but I believe governance is also um, maybe even more important. So how do you guys think or see that the ideal governance model should look like and what's the most important factors? So I'd like to talk before where the guy said all models are wrong, um, but some are useful. Uh, that was a great quote. Um, there, looking for an ideal governance model depends on your 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 drive, like what you're aiming for, what are your goals, um, and it also depends on the community around that. So, um, small communities who food sharing communities might have different governance mechanisms than everything else. It's about enabling the tooling so that each parachain uh, can use the governance systems that they want as much on chain as possible um, in our view um, because that will help uh, clear up and keep the social arguments moving forward. Um, yeah, so the Polkadot does have a governance model though and uh, it is based on uh, quorum adaptive based voting, which you can look up in, and go into on Polkadot's governance that's on GitHub. Um, but even that system is adaptive. Uh, if we find out uh, that this might not be the ideal governance model for the relay chain, it will be decided by the users to update that governance model. Do we want to include more inputs? Do we want to uh, uh, oh, there's a security hole, this is being abused, there's something happening. That's the key to this, is having uh, the ability to innovate and uh, adapt. Yeah, we'll have to cut it short here. Thanks for those nice last words. Uh, I love the panel. Uh, thank you so much, Jack, Phil, and Zaki. Give it up. Uh